Well, great to have you join me for Tough Questions. And today we're going to be talking about do miracles happen today? So what I want to do is I want to get a little theological and talk about some terminology related to uh, different views that Bible scholars and pastors and lay people have related to miracles and then talk about some of the reasons for miracles. But in between all of that, I'm going to tell you some personal stories that I've experienced with miracles today. And uh, so I think we're going to have a good time together as we talk about these things. Uh, so first off, uh, I want to talk about just some of the views related to miracles. And so there's two major categories when it comes to miracles. There's what's called cessationism, which is that um, well, I'll read, I'll read to you some definitions here, but cessationism it doesn't really have high expectations, especially of people using gifts, their spiritual gifts, to bring about miracles today. And then there's continuationism, which on the extreme of that, that all the gifts that we see in the New Testament are still happening today. and People have those kinds of gifts. And uh, we're going to talk again about what is a miracle, and just like we did in our last time together. Uh, and then I'm going to give you, again, some examples of miracles that I've experienced. And, uh, and then we're going to talk about the purpose of miracles today. So that's what we're going to do. So first of all, cessationism. What is it? Cessationism, according to Greg Allison, and all these initial definitions are from Greg Allison's The Baker Compact Dictionary of Theological Terms. I think he explains these terms as well as anybody. But he says cessationism is a term used with respect to spiritual gifts the position that whereas many of the gifts continue to be exercised, the so-called miraculous gifts, which would include prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, miracles, and healings, have ceased to operate in the church today. Their cessation is due to these gifts serving uh, to confirm the gospel at the foundation of the church and with the church's foundation having been laid, no longer being needed for its ongoing development. And I want you to know that for most of my Christian life, that's the position I held to. I no longer hold to that position, but I did hold to it at one time. And there's very godly men and women who know their Bibles and love the Lord who hold to this position. Um, but I no longer hold to that. And you're going to hear why in just a second. Continuationism is the position that I hold to, but not in an extreme way, which I'll explain as well. But continuationism is a term with respect to spiritual gifts. The position that all the gifts, including the miraculous gifts, prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, miracles and healings, continue to operate in the church today. And so, all of them are, are still needed and need to be exercised in uh, the world today. So you have cessationism on one hand, uh, these, these miraculous types of supernatural gifts are no longer being practiced today, and then you have continuationism which uh, expects those gifts that were going on in the New Testament church that we have like in the book of Acts and so forth to be going on today. So again, let's talk about what a miracle is. A miracle is a supernatural, extraordinary event that diverges from observed natural processes. As signs, miracles point to divine activity, the fact that God is, is being active. As wonders, they astonish onlookers. And as mighty works, they express the exceptional power of God. So that's a miracle. Now, how about miraculous gifts? Well, Greg Allison says miraculous gifts are certain kinds of spiritual gifts that require supernatural power to be exercised. And these are prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, word of knowledge, word of wisdoms, healings, and miracles. So what I want to do right now is I just want to share with you that I was a cessationist and I believed at one time, like, Many people who go to seminary today, especially if you go to Dallas Seminary or um, there's just certain schools that sort of have a cessationist uh, history and philosophy and theology of the miracles. And Dallas Seminary happens to be probably the, one of the most well known in regards to the position of cessationism. Now, cessationists 
do believe in miracles today, most of them. They, they believe that God still heals, God does all you, but they don't believe that the gifts are operating. So they do believe in the power of prayer and that God performs miracles today. So it's not like they're, they just don't believe in the miraculous at all. That's, that's liberals, that's non-Christians who don't believe in the virgin birth and the resurrection and that God heals today. No, cessationists believe in that. I've never talked to a cessationist that's an evangelical Christian that doesn't believe that God heals. And so that's not the issue. The issue is, do people have the miraculous gifts of, for instance, be able to pray for people and they have a high rate of those people being healed? So the reason I went from being a cessationist to being a continuationist, and again, I'm a, I'm, I would be called open but cautious. I believe that the gifts are going on. But I don't believe that miracles are just happening left and right, every day, everywhere, all the time. I think that miracles are, are less common than just the norm, but that God does intervene, and I believe that God does gift people in different places of the world at different times. My experience I'll share with you is a pretty amazing story because I went to India in 1999. I didn't want to go. There had been a revival taking place in Manipur, India, Northeast India, right across from Myanmar. And missionaries had gone there many years before that, like 100 years before I went, and planted seeds, saw very little fruit. Uh, the Bible had been translated into some of the dialects and languages when I was there just, uh, pretty recently. And a graduate from Dallas Theological Seminary named Peter Kashung was from there, went to Dallas Seminary, went back, started an orphanage, a seminary, planted a bunch of churches. And so I went with a team from my church where I was pastoring at the time, and there had been a, a few people from my church that had already been there uh, the previous year, so I went. And again, I didn't really want to go. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I don't have a huge passion for Indian food or Indian culture. Some people do, I didn't. It'd probably be the last place I'd choose to go on vacation. Uh, but this wasn't a vacation, it was a ministry trip. And what I heard and, uh, from people that had been there was that they needed serious theological training because there were so many people coming to Christ uh, they couldn't assimilate all these people in one church or even a few churches. They needed a multiple. They needed a bunch of churches. So when I got there, I was told there were going to be 250 pastors, most of whom had been converted within the year, um, and many people were being converted every day and assimilated into these churches. So I prepared theological material, and we took a team, and the team that we took would do evangelism every day and follow up with people who came to Christ. Now, just to give you an idea um, of some of the things that I experienced while I was there, when we got there, we had somebody who had the gift of prophecy come to us, and I'd never experienced that before, but they had shared with us probably five different specific things about our team that there was no way they would have known. There, they had no way of knowing. So that was sort of the first thing I experienced. The, that morning when this lady shared with us about her experience and, and started just sort of changing my world, changing my worldview and my thinking about cessationism, I just started thinking, wow, maybe there's something to some of these things that was experienced in the book of Acts that's happening in other parts of the world because they haven't been exposed to the gospel like we have. They don't have churches like we don't, they don't have resources like we have in the Western world. And so, um, so I experienced prophecy. I experienced um, prophecy myself. Uh, the very next day when I started preaching, or when I started teaching, I was supposed to teach between eight and 12 hours a day. Usually it was 12 hours a day while I was there for a week. And when I started, I didn't hear a voice but I was supposed to speak to 250 people. There was more like 700 plus people, standing room only, people everywhere in a Baptist church. And my translator, before I started, I had passed out all these uh, 100, over 100 pages of notes that I had prepared. And I sensed that God wanted me to speak on something else. So I looked at my translator and I said, I've never, this has never happened to me before, but I, I sense that I need to speak on the family and what the Bible has to speak about the role of the husband and the wife and the family. 
I don't know if that's a need for you guys, but I just sense that that's what God wants me to do. And he looked at me and he said, go with it. <laughs> so I did about 40 minutes into that. And again, that was prophecy because God had revealed something to me that I didn't know that they needed. It was exactly what they needed. And the reason was 40 minutes into it, my translator starts crying. He is literally bawling. And I look at him and I'm wondering what in the world is going on? And he says, look at everybody out there. And I looked closely and there were not only pastors, but many of their wives were there and even family members and people were hugging, they were crying. Many of them were on their knees in prayer about 40 minutes into my teaching on God's design for a marriage, God's design for the family, and how God would take care, because all these people were overwhelmed. They were mainly bivocational pastors, and they were overwhelmed at all these people that were coming to their churches, new converts every day, and they felt overwhelmed with the work and the ministry that was placed upon them in the church so that they were neglecting their marriages and they were neglecting their families. I didn't know any of this. Um, so I was able to listen to God in that time, in that day, and experience uh, something I'd never experienced before. And prophecy, uh, maybe I'll do a separate thing on prophecy, but the way I understand prophecy, the way Wayne Groom explains it, is it's an impression from the Holy Spirit of something that needs to be said to give exhortation and encouragement uh, to the body of Christ. It's separate. It's not the same as like a prophet in the Old Testament or an apostle in the New Testament that's given revelation from God that's for everyone. It's just specific to a group or a person and it's something that the Holy Spirit gives you. And I, I experienced that personally. I've never experienced it since, but I experienced it that one time in India. And that week, um, it, it was amazing. I mean, I, I was able to teach uh, over 60 hours of teaching with no preparation specifically to what I was teaching them, but it was all things that I'd learned from my own parents who were godly Christians. It was stuff I'd learned from books and from the Bible, and I was able to just take them through Genesis to Revelation on everything the Bible has to say about relationships, marriage, parenting, the family, and that was their top priority is manage your household well. And um, I can't even tell you how many people thanked me, uh, gave me blankets and clothes that they made me that week, and they were just so excited about it. And it was really cool to so scratch where they itched even having known nothing about that, I planned on doing something totally different. I believe that was a miracle. I, I believe that that was supernatural. It was from God. I, it, it, I didn't come up with it. Uh, God just worked in a miraculous way to really minister to these people where they needed ministering to. I've never experienced anything like that before that or since, but I did experience it that week. Well, one of the days I got to go out and I got to experience um, two incredible miracles. These are biblical type miracles. And again, my background cessationism. I don't believe that people have the gift of healing and miracles today at that time. So I go out with my translator who happened to be from Nepal. And this guy was an amazing guy. He was a, uh, he had been in uh, prison several times for sharing his faith. His back, I got to see his back one day, he showed it to me, was all full of whipped, uh, he had been whipped and beaten several times, so his back was just thrashed. He always had a smile on his face. Uh, loved Jesus with just a passion that up until that time I had never seen before. Always smiling, only had one set of clothes, and it was just old, dilapidated clothes. But this guy was on fire for the Lord. And I actually got to see him all the, every single one of these gifts I got to see in him that week. I don't have time to go into it all, but I'll give you the gift of healing that I think this man had. Again, I'd never seen this before and I haven't seen it since, but I saw it there. And I'm gonna tell you two just incredible experiences I had in one day. Well, three actually. So we went, I got to go out one day. My team was out evangelizing every day, but I got to go out for just a few hours. And in a few hours, 
I got to talk to 50 people. Uh, it was basically five families. And in those five families, we're talking grandparents and children and then some grandchildren. Um, I got to share the gospel with them and why I was in India and why I came there. And this is a very rural place. They were on a barter, barter system in this part of India, so there's no tour. They usually don't see any tourists at all. A lot of the children had never seen somebody, a, a white person like me. Um, and so they would touch me, and I'm sort of hairy except for the top of my head, but uh, they would touch my, they would like pet me and feel my hair, and they'd never seen that before. And, but anyway, um, we're, we're, we're out and 49 of the 50 people that I shared the gospel with received Christ. They repented of their sins that day, like 15 minutes after hearing the gospel. And then we were baptizing them in a river that went through the town uh, shortly after they, they repented of their sin and put their trust in Christ. 49 out of 50. Okay, I've never had anything like that before, never had anything like it since where it's almost like they were just waiting for you to tell them about Jesus. So one thing I want you to know is that if you're a Christian, you're a miracle. If you don't believe in miracles today, then you don't believe in Christianity because Christianity is supernatural. And what happens according to Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, we're not going to take the time to go there, but you can look at it yourself. But if you read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, what you'll find is the process that goes from us being dead spiritually. And then in verse four, it says that God makes us alive through the Holy Spirit. That's regeneration, that's being born again. Just like you were born physically and you had nothing to do with that, but boom, here you are physically. Spiritually, God takes dead men, dead women, dead uh, children, whatever, whatever your age is, and he makes us alive spiritually. That is a miracle. That's taking something dead that can't do anything and God makes you alive. So if you're converted, if you become a Christian, that's a miracle. So, so whether you're a cessationist, continuationist or not, we believe that it's a miracle that God saves anyone, that anybody who's saved, that is a miracle. So you believe in miracles if you're a Christian. Um, so anyway, but, but I saw 49 out of 50 people, uh, and, and what they would do is they would have, many of them had Hindu beads, and in their homes they would have, on their walls, they would have these pictures, because Hindus are uh, polytheists, they believe in many gods. So they'd have these different pictures of these different gods that they would pray to for different things, like the wheat god and the snake god, and they'd have all these different gods. They would put all that stuff in a pile, and they would put their beads in a pile, they would burn it, and then they would get baptized. So that was just an amazing experience in and of itself. That would have been the highlight of the trip for sure. But then I got to experience two amazing healing miracles. And a lot of people don't believe me. Um, you, you may be listening, you may not believe me. Uh, all I can say is I witnessed it, I saw it, I believe it. And that's why I'm not a cessationist because I believe that the translator I had had the gift of healing, biblical healing, just like the apostles did, just like the disciples did, and just like regular lay people did, which I'm gonna say, this is the reason why I believe this still continues today. However, it's not the norm, it's not common. It's rare, but I believe it still happens. So what I saw, the first healing miracle I saw, and I've never seen anything like this before, never seen anything like this since. We're walking to go get lunch after baptizing all, you know, 49 people who got saved that morning. So it's just a few hours that happened. Uh, we're going to get lunch and on our way back to where we were staying, our hotel, we would have lunch in our hotel uh, prepared by some of the Christians there for us. Um, we start hearing this wailing it's this, and it sounds like a little girl, and, and it's, she's screaming, but she's crying simultaneously. So my translator runs off, he goes to her, he comes back to me, and he's, he's basically, as he's running towards me, he's asking me to run or come to them. So I start running towards them. We get to uh, right outside their shack. Everybody lives, basically lives in these small shacks. They're, they're very different than the way they live here in America. Again, barter system. These people are hard workers, but they don't have a lot. 
Uh, and so like if you're a fisherman, you go into the town square and you, you, have, you caught eels that day, you trade some eels for uh, wheat or bread, whatever, whatever people are trading that day and they'd get what they need for the day and they went on their business and that, that was very common there. So these people had a goat I saw and the goat was laying down on the ground. I couldn't tell if the goat was alive or not, but what I could see is that one leg was completely black. It was a gray goat, sort of like a light grayish goat, laying on the ground, and this little girl was crying, and the guy told me, he said, well, this is their, they get their milk from this goat. So to lose this goat is a big deal. And so he looked at me and he said, start praying that God will heal this goat. Now, at the time, again, I'm a cessationist. I mean, I'm just, I, you know, I humor him. And, and honestly, I didn't believe that God was going to heal this goat. Um, to me, it looked like the goat was dead. So um, what's the use of praying for a dead goat? And again, I can't confirm whether or not the goat was dead or not. I just, I do know that there was a discoloration. The, one of the legs of the goat, I remember, was black and the rest of it was a different, the, the other three legs were a different color, and so he told me that the goat had been bit by a cobra. And in this area, they actually worshiped the cobra, which I have a great story about that, and I'll just tell it to you. So, so a lot of people worship the, the snake god, and they actually had a building that had a wooden cobra that had been carved, and it was big, it was probably 20 feet tall, in front of this shack like with a tin roof of a church and they worshiped the snake god there and because cobras were all over the place in this particular area they believed all they knew is that the cobra or the snake won in the garden so we used with them when i shared the gospel with them i just i shared genesis 3 15 which you can look up but it's, it's the passage where it talks about um, the serpent uh, bruising the heel of, and it's talking about the coming Messiah, but he, the Messiah, will crush the snake's head. And that's how you kill a snake, is you crush its head. So we started with that because we wanted them to know that the snake didn't win, that Jesus won on the cross. And then we'd go into the gospel. We'd talk about, you know, we'd sort of take them through the Romans road, what have you. But again, it only would take about 15 minutes for somebody to understand the gospel and respond and realize that Jesus was victorious over the snake. And so very interesting. So at the end of the week, the, uh, this church that, where everybody worshiped the snake, well, our people evangelized this area so that there were no more snake worshipers. They had all become Christians. So at the end of the week, they literally burned the, the snake, the, the image of the snake, and in its place, they put up a cross. And that was a very emotional um, ceremony to be a part of. Another thing that happened at that ceremony is there had been two warring tribes, and one tribe, their color was red, another tribe, their color was black. And, and the chiefs of each of these tribes had both become Christians, I don't think that week, but they had become Christians a few months before we got there. And again, a lot of people were becoming Christians. There was this revival breaking out they had killed members of each other's families in the past and these were two tribes that hated each other they were at war for hundreds of years when the chiefs became christians months before many people from their tribes became christians and so at this ceremony where they burned the snake god and put up a cross at the same ceremony i witnessed the two chiefs of these tribes forgive each other they had killed each other's family members and what they did, how they did it there is they had a machete and that's how they would, they would chop off somebody's head and then they would cut off uh, the hair and they would somehow put that into the wood handle of the machete. And so I was given at the ceremony a machete that had strands of hair of red and black. And what happened is they forgave each other in front of the whole tribe, many people that that night at that ceremony got saved and we took them over the river and baptized. It was just an amazing ceremony. And um, they forgave each other and there wasn't a dry eye in the place, but, but the power of the gospel, the power of, that you can forgive somebody who's killed one of your family members 
And so what they did is they gave me a machete. I was going to bring it today and I forgot, but I have it in my office at home. Uh, but it has strands of hair in black and red um, that represent the fact that now these tribes are united. And the way they explained it is the black was the blackness of sin and the red represents the blood of Christ. And that it says in the Bible in Ephesians 1, 7, that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And so they said that because Jesus has forgiven us, we're able to forgive each other. And he's able to help us with the, the blackness of our sin and then cleanse us of all unrighteousness because of his blood. And so they added white as their primary color that represents the purity and the holiness of Christ that has been imputed to us. Uh, when we confess our sin and repent of our sin and put our trust in the righteousness of Christ. Um, and it is an atoning death as a sacrifice for us. So that was an amazing thing. Getting back to the goat. So he prays for the goat and he tells me to pray that God would heal the goat. And what he tells me is he says, if I'm telling them in their language, he translates for me, he says, I'm telling them that if their goat's healed, that Jesus is the one who healed the goat and that they need to give their lives to this Jesus who has the power to heal their goat totally. So I'm praying that God would totally heal this goat. And again, I, I didn't know enough of what was going on in the culture and everything, anything else to know if, if the goat was dead or the goat was just dying. I don't know. What I saw was the goat that looked dead or dying to me. Um, the color of his leg, which was black, started changing direction. So instead of going towards his vital organs, uh, it, it's, the color started changing the opposite way. And eventually, the black in the leg was completely gone. The goat got up, and it was almost like um, watching... Um, just new life spring up in the goat. The goat was literally sort of prancing around and the family just started hugging each other and hugging the goat. The, the little girl, I can remember her like yesterday, just hugging the goat and they were praising Jesus. The only word I knew in their language was Jesus. I don't remember it, how you say it now. This was in 1999, so many years ago. But I remember him saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And before we knew it, he led the whole family to Christ and we took them over to the river and they were baptized. So I got to see a goat be totally healed uh, by my translator, who I believe had the gift of healing, just like you see in the New Testament. Well, we just baptized them and lo and behold, we're walking by the river. We're wondering or, uh, of whether or not we have time to get back to our hotel to get lunch. I wasn't really hungry at the time. I'm just thinking about all the people being converted that day and how exciting that was. Well, we see some monks coming. They were obviously monks. They looked like any monks you would see. They were bald. They had these robes on and he knew that they were from Myanmar. And they had come over and a lot of people were coming to this area because a lot of people were being healed. So he looks over at me and he said, just as the goat was healed, um, I think God's going to do another healing. And he said, look at that group. And there was, I can't remember, there was about a dozen of them, give or take a few. And the guy on the far left his right side, he was the very guy on the end, they were about a, uh, probably 50 yards away from us, walking towards us. And he said, do you notice anything strange about him? And I'm looking and, and sure enough, I, I, I see that his robe is cut off. It's like he's got um, one arm, his left arm was fully visible, but as I looked closely, it looked like he just had a stub here and there was no sleeve or anything. It had, actually was cut uh, up to the nub of his arm or stub at his shoulder. There was no arm. I said, he's missing his uh, right arm. And he said, yes. And then I knew what he was going to say. <laughs> he said, start praying, just like the goat, that God would grow his arm back. Now, again, I had never seen anything like this, never believed something like this could happen. But after I saw the goat, there was a little bit of faith, very little faith that God would grow this man's arm back. And same thing. He said, 
I'm going to tell him that if he's healed, if he gets his arm back um, to give their lives to Jesus, that Jesus is the one who has this power to heal his arm. So he talks to him for a few minutes. I'm literally shaking at this point because there, there's a part of me that's believing that God's going to grow this guy's arm back. And, and whereas I doubted with the goat, uh, there, there was less doubt here. Although I have to be honest that when, he, when we started praying and he put his arm on the nub, um, I had my eyes open. I wanted to see what would happen. He starts praying for him and his arm starts moving as his at first, it's just like the nub is growing and, and the nub, as it got further down to where the hand is, started to take shape in a hand. Um, I got to see, uh, again, it's just an absolute miracle. There's no natural explanation for this. There, he wasn't hiding an arm. I saw a nub grow into a full arm and hand that matched. This was his, his right arm, uh, matched his left arm. And I got to witness a miracle. And needless to say, just like with the goat, they're jumping up and down, they're hugging each other, they're hugging us. Before we know it, we're walking down to the river. They had repented of their sin, all of them, and put their trust in Christ, and they're all praising Jesus. Now, you can believe that I'm making this up. You know, it, uh, uh, one thing I would say is that um, I, I am not a cessationist at all. I believe that what I saw was real. And I believe that what miracles did in the New Testament, resulting in bringing God glory and salvation and confirming the gospel and so forth, I got to witness in India. And I have to be honest with you, um, I think the reason we don't see that much in the West is we're skeptical. Uh, we've been influenced by naturalism, and even though we believe that God, you know, performed these kinds of miracles in the New Testament, there's no way out of denying that, he, that this happened in the New Testament and even in the Old Testament. But a lot of people think this doesn't happen anymore, and I'm here to tell you it does. I saw it, and um, I will go to the grave believing that what I saw was a miracle, and I believe that this man that I was with from Nepal had the spiritual gift of miracles, healing, and he had other gifts that I got to witness as well that I'm not going to take the time to share because these, these were the two biggies that I witnessed. What do we make of this? You know, what do, I, what do I make of this? What do you make of this? Well, all I can say is, um, it, it, again, it changed my life. And now when I pray for people, I, I have yet to pray for somebody since then myself for healing in such a way that I could genuinely say um, that, was, that was my gift of healing. I've never seen that, but I have prayed for people to be healed that have been healed, where I believe God directly in answer to prayer healed them. And I'm gonna close our time with a passage about that. But before we get there, again, let me remind you of what a miracle is. A, a, a miracle, according to Max Turner, New Testament scholar, he says it's an extraordinary extraordinary or startling observable event, which what I just described to you was, it cannot reasonably be explained in terms of human abilities or other known forces in the world, which again, it, it, you can't explain it. It is perceived as a direct act of God. That's what it was. And it is usually understood to have symbolic or sign value. In other words, pointing to God as redeemer and judge. In, in these cases, these miracles led to the salvation of everybody who witnessed the miracle. And so it's exactly what we see happening in, for instance, the book of Acts. So a few words here that are used is a sign. A miracle is, is often a sign, and a sign is, is something that which uh, means something that points to or indicates something else, especially with reference to miracles, God's activity and power. So I got to witness the power of God in healing this goat, healing this man's uh, nub back to an arm. And I have no idea what happened to his arm originally, but he had fully functioning hands and an arm now where it was just a stub. That is 
direct, a direct act of God, unexplainable naturally. And then fourthly, he says, it is usually understood to have symbolic or sign. Oh, I already said that, sorry. Um, and then Wayne Grudem says that a miracle, I, I like his def definition because it's just short and concise, but his definition of a miracle is a less common kind of God's activity in which he arouses people's awe and wonder and bears witness to himself. So this was a wondrous event as well that caused people to be amazed. I was amazed. All these families, these monks were amazed at what God did, at the power of God. And so we wit witnessed a mighty work, a miracle of God in displaying his great power uh, and, his, and, and just his care for these people that were prayed for. Now, can we consider um, unusual answers to prayer to be miracles? Um, my wife, uh, just a few years ago, had uterine cancer. And when we went to the doctor she had, she had operated on, they took out her uterus. They, uh, they, we could see on the x-ray that there was a tumor there. When I talked to the doctor afterward, this was in San Francisco, Kaiser, uh, I talked to the doctor and the doctor said we had a lot of people praying and Dana believed that God was just going to heal her of this cancer. He was going to take away the, the tumor. I believed he could do that too, but I just thought she's going to be operated on they're going to take the tumor. Well, the doctor afterwards told us there was no tumor. Um, but because they were already in there and she'd already signed the paperwork and everything, they decided to take it out anyway as a precaution, the, the, the uterus and so forth. Um, I believe that was a miracle. I believe that was an answer to prayer. Does God always do that? No, but sometimes he does. And so when I pray for people, especially after what I experienced in, in India, I expect that God can heal, that God can supernaturally intervene, that when I share the gospel with people that are dead spiritually, that God can make them alive. I, I have a hard time being a Christian and not believing in the supernatural. And so all I can say is read your Bibles, look at what it has to say about that. And my view is I don't see any evidence that any of these things have ceased. Um, my experience has been that I see them, not all the time, but I see miracles uh, at least one or more a year. Every time I see somebody come to faith in Christ, I believe that's a miracle, but I've also seen healings. And again, nothing like I saw in India, but, but I, I have seen answers to prayer. Now, one more thing uh, before I wind this thing down is that Miracles have had certain periods of time where there's more miracles than at other times. In the Old Testament, it's interesting that miracles happen through people like Moses, Elijah, Elisha. It was usually through an individual. But under the New Covenant, when the New Testament uh, was forming and the church was beginning, there was a high concentration of miracles. And again, you can just read the book of Acts and see that. But I want you to also realize that it wasn't just the apostles that were performing miracles. If you read 1 Corinthians 12 or Galatians 3, you see that just the rank and file Christians were also seeing miracles happen. There's nothing in the New Testament that says that miracles are going to stop. There's a few verses that are sort of taken that way. I believe they're taken out of context. And I believe that the overwhelming experience of New Testament Christians that carries on today is that we are, expect, we are to expect miracles. Uh, we're to pray for miracles. We're to believe that God is in the business of the supernatural in both to bring about our salvation from dead people spiritually and also to heal. Does he always do that? No. But should we expect that? Yes. And I believe that the more that we experience the supernatural, the more confidence it gives us in praying for God to save and to heal those that we love. Now, um, five purposes I want to give you of miracles. Uh, miracles authenticate the gospel. And I, I have a lot of verses, but I'm just going to read one for each of this. In John 3, 2, uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says, no one can do the signs 
that you are doing unless God is with him. So one of the reasons for miracles is it authenticates the message of the gospel or the messenger of the gospel to show that there's something different about this message and it points to the supernatural God that's behind it. So sometimes God does miracles to authenticate the message, just as he did with Jesus, the apostles, and, and the rank and file Christians of the day, and still does today around the world. Secondly, miracles show that God's kingdom has begun. In Matthew 4, 23, it says that Jesus came proclaiming the gospel, uh, gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and uh, affliction. So Jesus and the apostles, and still in different places of the world, they don't have hospitals. They don't have medicine like we do. So that's why a lot of missionaries that go overseas who start out as cessationists end up being continuationists. They don't have the resources to take these people to doctor and give them the medicine they need. And oftentimes they pray in faith and these people are healed. Now there's a book by uh, Craig Keener, two books two volumes over a thousand pages each, where he documents hundreds of healings around the world, even in the United States, interviewing doctors, witnesses, that the explanation, basically the definition of all of these things are, are a miracle. It's a, it's a sign, it's, it brings wonder, it glorifies God, and it authentic, authenticates the gospel, and it shows God's care for humanity in healing us of our infirmities and I would highly recommend those to you. A short book that you could read is The Case for Miracles by Lee Strobel uh, and Lee Strobel interviews quite a few people and I, th I don't think you can read The Case for Miracles and stay a cessationist. Um, and then Miracles by Eric Metaxas is another good but there's a lot of books that I have on this but those are three that you can read. Check out for yourself. Do the research. Compare the scriptures with reality. A fourth uh, a third thing that happens, or the purpose of miracles, is that it helps those in need. I mean, in Matthew 14, 14, it just says that Jesus went ashore. I mean, this is after feeding the 5,000. Um, he goes ashore and he has compassion on the people and it says he healed the sick. And it was just Jesus seeing people that are helpless, that are hurting, that are in pain. And the purpose of the miracles he performs is just to heal just to relieve their pain, to relieve their affliction. And we see this kind of thing going on all over the world today. And we can pray for people that God would heal them and believe in faith that he can do that. Another thing is it is a purpose of miracles. A fourth thing is it removes hindrances to people's ministries. And in Matthew 8, uh, 15, we see that um, the paralytic, uh, or, or, or actually, um, uh, a woman was healed, and when she was healed, she went on to serve Jesus. And so sometimes God heals somebody who can't do something so that they can serve God. They don't have the ability, and then they have the ability, and they use that ability to serve God. And God is merciful to some people in that way. And then a last thing, and this is the most important thing about miracles, is it brings glory to God. It draws attention to the fact that the same God who created everything that exists, including you and me, and sustains all of this, is a supernatural being. He brings, he, he, he creates everything out of nothing. That is a miracle. And the way he designed the world and everything and how it functions and how we can breathe and have enough oxygen today and so forth is because of his mercy and his grace. And then, um, you know, it's interesting that in Matthew 9, 8, when Jesus healed the paralytic, uh, the first thing the paralytic did is he started bringing glory to God. He started glorifying God. When I saw the miracles in India, that's the first thing we all did is we praised Jesus, we thanked Jesus, and they gave their lives to Jesus. And in some cases, my translator, for instance, died as a martyr. That area was open for three years. There were thousands of healings, thousands of conversions. And my view is I'm somewhere in the middle of a, of a cessationist, a continuationist. I believe that in areas where the Bible has newly been translated and they don't have hospitals and resources like a lot of the Western world, that in those areas in particular, God will perform miracles 
because the people just believe the Bible when they read it, that the same God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Elisha, Moses, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul and Peter is the same God today. And I, I think we need all that hope we can get to live out the Christian life. So I firmly believe in a God who works miracles, and I hope you do too. And I want to close with a passage from James. And James is interesting because you, what you'll see like in Galatians and Corinthians, it's expected that we would pray that people will be healed. And so even if you don't believe in the gift of healing, like I explained with my uh, friend from Nepal, even if you don't believe that people have that gift, we're called to pray for people to be healed. And I just want to share this uh, last thing with you before we close our time together. James chapter 5, starting at verse 14. And again, this was the brother of Jesus writing this, who again was a skeptic before the resurrection. And then he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. And so he said, is any one among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now, mind you, I'm an elder of the church. And it doesn't say there's a time period on this. It doesn't say this is only going to happen before the canons close. No, that's, that's all speculation. That's all hearsay. The reality is this is an expectation uh, of what's normative. And so he says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? That you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And then he goes back to the Old Testament and uses the example of Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. In other words, it was a miracle in answer to his prayer. And again, Old Testament, we have New Testament, and there's nothing that says, don't do this anymore when the New Testament's closed. I think that's a ridiculous argument. So um, then he says, he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. And I believe that part of the fruit that God has for you and for me is that we would be just like Elijah. We would just be like the Apostle Paul. We would be like regular uh, leaders in the New Testament church on until today, till Jesus returns, that there's power in prayer because what we're doing is we're talking to God about what God cares about. God cares about saving people that are lost. He cares about raising the dead spiritually to life. That's what he does when he regenerates us. When we're born again, God does a miracle. And God does that same kind of miracle with people that are sick. Now, is everybody going to be healed or saved? No. But you know what? The example of scriptures and the example of church history and the example of what's going on in the world today is that God is in the business of salvation and God is in the business of healing. And so my hope is that it, this has encouraged you to be more of a man of woman of faith and of belief and dive into the scriptures and investigate for yourself whether these things are no more or whether they're to continue. And I think that if you really read the Bible carefully, you'll see and come to the position that I have that yes, there are special times in history of healings. Yes, God doesn't always heal. Yes, God doesn't always save. But you know what? There are also times where he does. And the means he uses is our faith in the God who heals and saves. So God bless you. I hope this has encouraged you. I hope you believe my story because it really happened. And I hope that if you need healing or you need salvation, that you will draw near to God and he will draw near to you and that you will have the privilege of witnessing miracles just as I have because we have an awesome, powerful, caring God. God bless you and enjoy the rest of your day and expect him to work and to act in your behalf and those that you love.